Obeisance to Maguru and Protector Manjushri, who holds as his heart the scriptural text symbolic of his seeing all things as they are, whose understanding shines forth as the sun unclouded by defilements of traces of ignorance, who teaches in sixty ways for the patient's love and father of his only son, all creatures caught in the prison of samsara, confused in the darkness of their ignorance, overwhelmed by their suffering. You who struggle and plunder the proclamation of the Dhamma arises up from the stupor of our delusions and frees us from the iron chains of our karma, whose powerful sword of wisdom hews our suffering wherever it sprouts appears, clearing away all the darkness of all ignorance. I entreat you, O Manjushu, whose princely body is adorned with the 112 marks of action, who has completed the 10 stages achieving the highest perfection of the Bodhisattva, who has been pure from the beginning, O Manjushri, O loving one, with the brilliance of your wisdom, illuminate the darkness and close in my mind, enlighten my intelligence and wisdom so that I may gain insight into the Buddha's words and the text that explain them. Now we're going to do um, the refuge prayer before teachings, refuge in Bodhicitta. Um, do, would, you, would you guys want to do it in English or Tibetan? I prefer English. Prefer English. All right, let's go with the English. I go for refuge and till I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Christ. On the virtuous merit of listening to the teachings and my attendance of the Buddha to be able to benefit all I go for refuge and till I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Christ. On the virtuous merit of my listening to the teachings and my attendance of the Buddha to be able to benefit all I go for refuge and till I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Christ. On the virtuous merit track, like by, by listening to the teaching, tonight to the state of the Buddha to be able to benefit all sentient beings. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're sorry, we will be with you in a second. We're trying to work out the projector cable, which is quite sensitive. Let's see if it works now. Yeah, okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who do not know me, uh, after I've been, in, I've been here also for the morning session, my name is Karatsun or Yaki. Karatsun is a contraction of Kamatsundu. And I've been involved here with a study program for a few years. So um, there are a few things that I wanted to begin with in this afternoon session. First of all, I'm going to begin with some technicalities. Um, speak first of all about our um, chat, our Zoom sessions, and also YouTube Live and Dropbox. So. Um, we have decided to live stream the teachings on YouTube. Then YouTube automatically saves the, um, the sessions to our YouTube, YouTube channel. So I just wanted to show you how you access our YouTube channel. So I'm going to um, share my screen with you. I just wanted to make sure that there's nothing embarrassing. So there's nothing embarrassing. Okay, I can now share the screen with you. All right. So, YouTube channel, just a second. So, supposedly go to YouTube, right? So, you go to YouTube. We have a channel that is called, surprisingly, Chimrezik Institute, right? So, on your browser, you could, you could type Chimrezik Institute. Sorry, I'll ch Chimrezik Institute. Then, this is the logo of our channel, go to Chimrezik Institute. Now, we have different playlists that we've created. So we have a playlist of the Guide to Bodhisattva Way of Life where um, Geshe's teaching, right? So all the morning sessions are going to be stored on our playlist, including the meditation session and also the afternoon tutorials. So if you happen to be missing a session or two or a day, then you can go to our YouTube channel and find everything. Now on top of that, you can of course subscribe to our YouTube channel so that also other teachings um, that are gonna be available. Like for example, if you look at a playlist, again, so we have um, events, we have Discovering Buddhism. Recently, Venable Chuki has done teachings on 
developing bodhicitta so it's um it's already uploaded we have the middling lam ring geshe's friday morning teachings are also uploaded and also the thursday evening teaching so that's our youtube channel now also we are recording um the sessions um we are recording the sessions the audio recordings sorry the audio recordings of the, of the sessions are going to be in dropbox and we also going to be producing transcriptions of those teachings so you have all those materials available to you including also i think some teachings from previous years and also some commentaries and review questions and so forth so um there's quite a lot of material that um everyone can use now this is as i think that is kathy said i think that this is the fifth round of bsp buddhist study program that we run here at chimrezik institute which has taken us more than 20 years so um Geshe Tassering taught this text a few times. Geshe Jamen taught it a few times. This is the second time round that Geshe Tsultrim is teaching this text. Um, and this, is, this text is one of the hallmark texts in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It is considered to be one of the, you know, one of the classics. So across all traditions within Tibetan Buddhism, not only the Gelug tradition, but also the Kagyu, the, the Nyingma, the Sakya, this text is considered to be one of the pivotal texts um, that people study. So, um, as Geshe said, it was composed by the great Bodhisattva Shantideva, um, who was interestingly an eighth century Nalanda scholar. So, sometimes, kind of, when I think of the evolution of Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet and how it ran, ran parallel to the Indian tradition over a few centuries until the destruction of the Nalanda Monastery, which, as far as I remember, occurred around the 11th century. Um, it's quite interesting to think that, I think that commonly accepted Buddhism started to arrive in Tibet around the 7th century, right? 7th century, the first dissemination of Buddhism in Tibet, then it was the 8th century. 7th century, as far as I remember, Gurimpuche um, arrived in Tibet, then Kamala Shila and um, Shantarakshita were also invited to Tibet. The first monastery was established in Tibet, Sami Monastery. And then sometimes later, Shantideva was active at Nalanda Monastery. So it's actually interesting to think of that Buddhism is all, was already making its way from India to Tibet. Translation teams were established in order to translate the works of great Indian masters into Tibetan. Then Shantideva, an 8th century scholar, wrote his Guide to Bodhisattva Way of Life, which I don't know at which point he made it to Tibet, but you know, it became one of those great texts in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So made, I made myself um, a few points of things that I wanted to speak about today. So I'm just going to look at my points. Just a second, where is it? All right, um, so the way that we studied BP before was we had um, sometimes over two days a week, sometimes over four days a week. This time around, we're going to do it over three days a week. We have Geshe teachings, afternoon tutorials with me. We also have um, discussion sessions afternoon. We also have morning meditations. Now. FPMT wants it to be not only an academic program, but also a program that we implement in a daily practice. And for that, we are encouraged by Lama Sopra Rinpoche to evaluate ourselves, to evaluate our mind, to check our mind, to see how much our mind is in line with the teachings. I think that, you know, for some of us, we have some resistance to, to this self-evaluation technique. You know, it, it also... I think you know, in previous conversations that I had with people here at the center, they said that it sounds very American. It feels very American, you know, and I think that the FPMT central office is located in America. So maybe, you know, maybe it has 
connection with that. I don't know, but it's also an excellent system to, you know, if you want to develop a methodology of just evaluating your mind, kind of, and also monitoring your mind on a daily basis, looking at how many occasions a day you had afflictive states of mind arising in your mind. Are you making a progress? Are you actually stepping back or kind of, you know, even deteriorating? Even though this system might be a bit foreign to us, so kind of a bit annoying, they're still benefiting doing that. So FMT would like us to have this integrative, integrative um, aspects of our studies, not only study, but also practice. So please, as much as you can, try to consider that. You know, although some of us might feel resistant to it, it's still good, at least in some sense, to see how much is our mind in line with the teachings, how you know, are the teachings echoed in a daily behavior and also in a meditation session. So since this is also a program that um, people are accredited, accredited for, then we have, uh, we have to conduct some assessments, some um, tests or exams. So some people are also resistant to doing evaluations, you know, to doing tests, exams, and so forth. I've worked for quite a few years with Geshe Jamming, and he said that um, when we look at our dislike of doing exams, he says that, first of all, we can consider the exams to be something that helps us to see how we're doing with the text. Are we, you know, what are the points that we are missing? What are our weak sides, can we retain the information? Can we pull out the information where we need it? So rather than thinking about it as like a kind of exam or test that you, that you sit at uni or you know, another course that you do, look at it as your own self-evaluation to look at how well you're doing in your studies. On top of that, it says that, it said that when you kind of have that resistance to doing an exam and kind of you think that someone is seeing your exam, someone is marking it, and someone is judging you and so forth. It says that this is all man manifestation of not only this self-cherishing mind or ego-grasping mind, but also there might be pride that is present in this process. So it says that also, when we think of why we're here, we're here to combat, to fight our own afflictive states of mind. You know? So we're not here to give rise to them, to indulge in our afflictive states of mind. So even as far as just looking at what our reaction is towards having some assessment, having some exam, are, is it that our afflictive states of mind prevent us from doing that? Are we being lazy? Are we being proud? Are, do we have a low self-esteem, low self-confidence? Why are we resisting to that? It's also, I think, one good thing to keep in mind as part of our self-evaluation. So this time, this time round, we have uh, quite a few people doing this course together with us. I don't know how many people will sit for the exam and how many people are planning to um, participate actively in this exam. So um, I don't know what the workload will be from my side. So what I thought of doing was to produce, first of all, weekly review uh, questions that we will send to all of you, you know, that you could use in order to um, see how you're doing with the material. I will include questions from my tutorials and also from Geshe Sultim's tutorial. And that will be the basis for setting exams. Now, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do it once a module or maybe every two weeks or every three weeks. Um, let me think about it. I'll also discuss it with my friends here at Jumrezik Institute. And also, if you guys have at home, if you have any input, any requests and so forth, we can consider that all. And at the end, we'll decide whether we do it once um, a module or every two weeks or every three weeks. Um, so that with respect to the exam. Let me see what else, what's next on my list. All right. So now this Guide to Bodhisattva Way of Life, as I said, is this amazing text, pivotal text in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, not only in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, it is also studied in China and in other places. Now, it is a manual not only for developing bodhicitta, but also 
practicing the six perfections, the six perfections of bodhisattvas. So since it covers such a broad spectrum of teachings, it also includes some lumbering teachings. So you have here meditations on a precious human rebirth. You have meditations on um, suffering. You have meditations on emerging from cyclic existence. So they're arranged differently. They're not arranged in the lumbering sequence, but they're still present here. So as such, when we consider how much material there is in this text and what our approach to study, to study the, the, this text is, then um, what I would advise based upon my personal experience is to, to begin with to do a lot of pigeonholing. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to remember everything that Shantideva said in this text right from the very get-go. I mean, some of you might be prodigies. Uh, some of you might be amazing scholars and practitioners that would be able to hold on to everything that is found in this text, but I'm not like that. You know? So I remember that the first time that we've studied up with Geshe Steering, we were going kind of pen, session after session in reading 20 verses a session, 30, 30 verses a session. There was session with 40 verses. And at some point I found myself, this is too much. Kind of, no, I cannot hold on to this material. It's not working out for me. It's not an efficient way for me to study. But I think that all along what I was missing is the kind of this system of pigeonholing, knowing, first of all, taking notes of, where the different points in the material are. Which chapters are we covering? What practices are we covering? If in the future I need to access, access this information, where do I find it? You know, so this is part of our study. And I, I suggest that we also try to integrate that in, uh, in the way that we study. You know? So we're not going to be able to take everything up now and put it into practice, but at least we want to know where to find it in the future when we want to put it into practice. So the way that we want to put it into practice is not only in our meditation sessions, but also in our day-to-day -day activities. You know, after all, we want to be practicing um, not only med formal meditation sessions, but also to acquaint our mind with positive states, with the deeds of bodhisattvas, with the altruistic intention of bodhisattvas also in between sessions so that we integrate everything into a Mahayana practice. So we want to know where to find this information. And this is part of our, the way that we study this text here. Now, we have great things that help us to study this material, such as outlines. So we have um, outline um, on a Dropbox. Let's see. Try to put it on our screen, see if we can. So. Um, we have outlines. Um, let's see, let's see. This is not the outline that I was looking for, just a second. Yeah. So we have, for example, on a, uh, we have the root verses by Shantideva with outline from the commentary of the commentary of Gyatsabje. So we have all the outline, and we also have the verses, um, the different lines in verses, different sections. Sometimes a few verses in one um, point in the outline. All of them divided according to the outline. So please use that because it gives us a really great mind map into the text. So this is, I think, this is all in our Dropbox. And if it's not now, then it will be after this session. Um, so please make sure that um, you also have a, have a look at the outline and also create those pathway, pathways in your mind, in your brain for integrating this material in a structured way. All right. Now, next, what I wanted to um, speak of is the general outline of the text and the list of chapters. All right. So, you know, to do that, I'm going to share my screen with you again. So, Geshla today read the list of chapters from um, the 
outline of Gesa Dhamma Lincheon's text. If you look at the way that the root um, verses, that the different chapters are lined out in a text, um, all those chapters are also, all those, chap all those names are the titles of the different chapters that we cover. So first of all, we have an explanation of the benefits of the mind of enlightenment. That's the first chapter. The second chapter is confessing negativities, laying down negativities. Interestingly, by the way, the word in Tibetan for confession is shakpa. I'll stop here for a second. So the, the word in Tibetan for confession and purification is shakpa. Now, the word shakpa itself has the meaning of laying something down. So it's not only that you disclose your negativities, you, within that you also decide that you're going to restrain your mind and you're just going to put a stop to it. You're going to lay down all your negativities in this way, right? So sometimes this word in Tibetan shakpa is translated as to confess. Sometimes it is to purify. Sometimes it is to disclose your negativities. But we can think about the meaning of all of them together in that we're just going to, first of all, declare them and just lay them down, give them a rest. So that's the, that's the second chapter. I'm going to put it on the screen again. Confessing negativities. Then the third chapter is completely upholding the mind of enlightenment. Now, before I continue with, with that, with a list of um, chapters, if we just look at the structure of Shantideva's text, can you, can you see this on the screen, by the way? Cool. All right. So the way that the, this manual works is that you have, um, first of all, the idea is that as Geshe said, you first of all become enthused about developing bodhicitta. Right? So you become really enthused about developing bodhicitta and you do that through finding out the benefits, the great benefits of bodhicitta. That's chapter number one. Then in chapter number three, we haven't spoken about chapter number two yet, but in chapter number three, halfway through the chapter, you make a commitment in the form of aspiring mind of enlightenment. You make a commitment to attend the state of enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. But then on top of that, you're making a commitment to train in the deeds of bodhisattvas, the practices of bodhisattvas. Not only you're making a commitment, you're actually taking the bodhisattva vow in chapter number three. So first of all, in chapter number one, you become enthused about developing bodhicitta. Then in chapter number three, you're working towards taking up aspiring bodhicitta and then making the, com the commitment of engaging bodhicitta. So you need to prepare your mind to do it. So you prepare your mind in terms of the seven limbs of, the seven limbs, the seven limbs of worship. So in the seven limbs, you have prostrations and confession of, um, and making offerings. Then you um, confessing, sorry, uh, um, so you have um, paying homage, making offerings, um, um, purification. Then you have rejoicing in virtue. You request, you make requests to turn the will of Dhamma, not to pass into Nirvana. And at the end, you also make dedication prayers. So we go in chapter number two and halfway through chapter number three, through the seven limbs, um, including the purification of negativities in order to make sure that we have enough merit and we have purified enough negativities in order to develop the mind of enlightenment and take the Bodhisattva vows. Then once we take the Bodhisattva vow, we go through the rest of the limbs. So we kind of, we do dedication, rejoicing in virtue and or maybe rejoicing in virtue is before that. But anyway, the taking up of the Bodhisattva vow in chapter number three is combined with the seven limbs. So we cover the seven limbs of, the, of chapter number two and chapter number three. So altogether, when you look at chapter one, two, and three, they give you this framework of developing bodhicitta and then being committed to training in the Bodhisattva deeds. That's the first three chapters. Then let's look at the next three chapters. So we have teaching on conscientiousness, guarding introspection and alertness, and relying on patience. So the thing is that you have given rise to bodhicitta. You have made a commitment to train 
in the Bodhisattva deeds. But it is possible that you encounter obstacles, hindrances, hindrances and so forth, difficulties in keeping up with the training. So in, in order to prevent bodhicitta and your vow from declining, you need to have ethics and you need to have patience. So then in order to guard ethics, the perfection of ethics is taught across chapter number four and chapter number five. Right, so you have guarding mindfulness, mindfulness of your own ethics, mindfulness of your own behavior, and also alertness. You want to be alert to whatever you do, right? So that covers, you could say, covers the perfection of ethics. And then you have chapter number six that teaches us patience, which is also something that is totally indispensable in order to guard the mind of enlightenment and also to guard the trainings of the mind of enlightenment, the six perfections. If we, we, all, we all have been, we've all been angry before. You know, we've been angry. I assume that all of us have hated others. I've hated others. You know, there's people that I still kind of dislike, although, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to think like that. No, but I still have this natural reaction to some people that makes me flinch, you know. So all those different things undermine bodhicitta. They undermine the training of the mind of enlightenment. So... Chapter number six, which is an amazing chapter, teaches us the perfection of patience, which is what we need in order to guard the trainings in bodhicitta. I mean, not only that, we will cover the sixth chapter and it presents us with so many different scenarios in which anger, hostility, aversion, and so forth arise. So we need to pigeonhole that. We need to know when to use this material in which situation and always remind ourselves um, of the practice of patience. So we spoke about chapter I briefly spoke about chapter four, five, and six. Then we have, let's look at the next few chapters. Then we have teaching joyous effort, teaching absorption, and the wisdom chapter, chapters seven, eight, and nine. So do you remember by heart what the six perfections are? First perfection, also those of, those of you at home, first perfection. Generosity, second perfection, ethics, third perfection, patience, fourth. No, no ethics is the second one. So, the, sorry? Is it morality? Is the next one? No, no. so, all right, so let, let's begin from the beginning. The first one is generosity. Generosity, yeah. The second perfection is morality or ethics, right? So, morality and ethics are the same. Sometimes we also call it ethical discipline. That's the second perfection. Third perfection? Patience. That's patience. Correct. correct. Patience. Fourth perfection? Joyous effort. Joyous effort. Joyous effort. Bingo. Fifth one? Uh, concentration. Concentration. That's correct. Now, interestingly, the way, no, concentration is a translation of a Sanskrit word that is called, Sanskrit word that is called samadhi. I yeah. think that Jampa mentioned it before. But we also have another word that is called that we use in English, which is called absorption. In Indian language, it is called dhyana. So the name of this chapter, chapter number eight, or the, the fifth perfection, is dealing with dhyana, with absorption. We do train in concentration, but it comes on, under the banner of absorption. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about it later on. So if you don't understand what's the difference between the two, hold your horses. We will talk about it. Um, so that's the fifth perfection, concentration, absorption. The sixth perfection? Wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom. that's great. So basically we have, um, we have mentioned the perfection of ethics and the perfection of patience. They are covered across chapters four, five, and six. Then we have the fourth perfection, joy effort. The fifth perfection, absorption. And the sixth perfection, wisdom, that are covered in chapters seven, eight, and nine. So we have one perfection missing, right? In a sense that if you look at the perfections that we mentioned up until now and how they are taught in um, the text, you might wonder, what about the first perfection, the perfection of generosity? Where is it in the text? I'm wondering if anyone at home knows where the perfection is under, the, under your bonnet, your bonnet, bonnet, bonnet.
All right, so the perfection of generosity is actually found in different chapters in Shantideva's guide. So no, although there wasn't any chapter that was dedicated just for generosity, you can still find bits of generosity. So you can regard, for example, chapter number 10, which is the chapter on dedication, is, um, um, is, t is some of the practices of generosity, but also other bits of generosity all across the text. So we spoke about the nine chapters up until now, and then we have the 10th chapter, which is the chapter on dedication that comes at the end. Well, dedication is quite, I think, self-explanatory. So, um, oh, is it enthusiasm, joyous effort? Yeah, that's chapter number seven. That's the fourth perfection. Right, so the seventh chapter, chapter joyous effort, teaches us enthusiasm or um, joyous effort, enthusiastic diligence. You know, it can be quite mouthful. So, um, let's look at my notes again. So, you know, often we end sessions with reciting this dedication verse. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta, which has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has not arisen never diminish, but increase more and more, right? This is how we want to approach our practice of bodhicitta and the, and the bodhisattva practice, the six perfections. So, May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta, which is not arisen, arise and grow. We cover that in page in chapters one, two, and three. So speaking of the benefits of bodhicitta, then preparing a mind for engaging bodhicitta and for the bodhisattva vow, we then give rise to bodhicitta if it hasn't arisen so far. Then we need to also protect bodhicitta from declining. So may in may that which has not arisen never diminish. So we have chapter number four to six. So conscientious, so mindfulness, conscientious, sorry, no, should be conscientiousness, alertness, and patience. Those three chapters deal with that wish for bodhicitta not to decline, never to diminish. We want to keep it to prevent it from deteriorating. The last line says, may it increase more and more. So how do we increase bodhicitta? We, incre we increase it with joyous effort. We increase it with absorption. And we increase it with wisdom. Then we have the dedication chapter. So any questions so far? You guys at home, you guys here, any questions? Carson, can you just put that last screen up again? I just someone just came to my door. Sorry. Right. No worries. <laughs> All right. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta, which is not a reason, arise and grow, covers chapter one, two, and three. May that which has arisen never diminish, chapter four, five, and six. Then chapter eight, seven, sorry, it should be here, I'll correct it. Seven seven, eight, and nine um, deal with the wish, the, the intent for bodhicitta to increase more and more. We increase that with joyous effort, with absorption, concentration, and with wisdom. Now, in chapter number eight, which teaches absorption, the main type of meditation that is taught is equalizing and exchanging self with others. So I think that there are 180 or more verses in this chapter most of them dedicated to um, equalizing, exchanging self with others, which is um, also linked up with the development of calm abiding, Shine. So that, that's an amazing chapter. It also gives us a lot of, you know, many things to work with. So um, this is the general outline of the text. Now, Geshla is gonna continue teaching this text over the next few months. Now, I just wanted to maybe give you the head up in a way that Tibetan, you know, a Tibetan Geshe, Tibetan master normally approaches a text like that. In their traditional study in a monastery, um, they hardly have semesters. Of course they have study periods, but basically you study text, you go to sessions with your teacher. There's no timetable, clear timetable in which 
um, the teacher should cover a certain topic you know, by a certain date. Of course, they do have to progress to make sure that they cover the material, they progress along, along with other classes. Of course, they do that. They have a certain structure, but it's not as strict as the structure that you get when you, when you go to teacher's training at uni. You know? So you don't prepare classes. You don't have preparations like I did. You know? It's not that you create lists and so forth. The, the way that normally a monk would study would be to, first of all, read the text before they go to class then go to class, the teacher might present something or the class would be done in the form of question and answer or you know, certain debate. Of course, the teacher would also speak quite a lot, but it's not, a, it's not done necessarily as formally as we do it here. I mean, of course, there are different ways of conduct, conducting classes in monasteries, but since this is the traditional way, you no, know, and then the monks would go and debate this material in the evening, and since that was for many centuries, the way that classes were conducted, and they didn't have any, any aids like, you know, PowerPoints, presentations, and ways of creating outlines with, you know, the right um, indent, you, do you say? Indent? Yes. Yeah, indent. You know, so basically you got kind of the whole chunk of material one point after the next, and you yourself had to work it out, work it out in your mind. So. Now, when we ask Geshla to teach this text, and it's such a long text, you know, Geshla, it's not his, um, I think that he's not, he's not used to kind of thinking over the next six weeks, this is what I'm going to cover. You no, know, it's just going to roll with that. And it will take however long it will take. You know? So when I started working at Chimrazi Institute, I started working with Geshe Jamin. And he had that habit because this is how they know we had we decided that we're going to have study modules of eight weeks which we had to cover a whole topic no he just took it leisurely in the way that he wanted to take it and like i was i was always kind of saying that you're not going to cover be able to finish the text we're not going to be able to cover everything so you know we used to speed up at the end um you know spin our wheels at the end so this time around we have we have decided to um, do this topic for the rest of this year, you know, which I think have created some pain for Kathy Victor. So we apologize, Kathy Victor. Um, you know, coronavirus have put a spanner in everyone's work. Um, but we can look at that from the positive side. We, um, you know, we've planned to teach, the original plan was to teach it over two modules of six weeks which you know, to begin with, I didn't think that it would work. You know, I didn't think that we'll manage to cover so much material over only 12 weeks. Now, because we had to close down the center and we have no idea how things are gonna fare in three months, four months, five months. No, it is likely that we will stay still closed for quite a few months. We have the leisure to teach it for the rest of time. Now, in some sense, there is no reason to rush through it. And also for quite a few years, we've been struggling or debating, also making our teachings available online, putting it on YouTube or making it, you know, using some other formats for people to be able to study at home. So um, we've been always struggling with that, but you know, then COVID-19 came in, we had to close down and we were forced to go online. So, you know, there's some blessings also in this situation. The teachings are also going to be available online. I think that probably the downside of making those teachings available online is that I think that when you're at home, you might be more subject to rumination, to mental wandering, to interferences from the outside. You'll be more prone to being lazy in a sense that you can think that it's going to be on YouTube, so I can listen to that later on. Make sure that the way that the way that you study at home is not that compromised. I think that it's hard, but make sure that you do not submit to your own lab, to your own laziness. At least you know I do. I often submit to my own laziness, but don't be like me. Anyway, so. Um, Let's look at the next thing that I wanted to mention today. Just a second. Um, all right. So, Geshla started today the text. 
Um, I'm going to find it here. I think it's here. Okay. So we've started with the first verse in the first chapter that explains the the first chapter ex explains the benefit of bodhicitta. But before we get to the benefits of bodhicitta, um, the first verse, we first of all have some introduction of Shantideva. So first of all, it will, it will pay homage. It will also make a, a pledge to compose the text. There will also be some words of humility in which Shantideva will say that he has nothing new to present to us, but you know, if he wrote it to his own benefit, it's but um, um, quite a traditional way of composing a text like that, but it's not just a lip service. No, it, it was obviously genuine when he said that. Anyway, so we started the first chapter with the first two lines from this verse in which it says, respectfully, I pay homage to the Sugatas who are endowed with the Dhammakaya, as well as the children and to all who are worthy of homage. So what I thought of doing today, um, and also to speak about what I'm going to do in my next tutorials from this time point onwards. My guess is that Geshla will just stick with the commentaries that he mentioned, with Getsa Damarinchen, with Kempo, forgot the name of the Kempo. Yeah, the other Kempo. Um, so it's going to stick with that. And what I thought of doing in my tutorials is also to slot in some things that we have studied before in other study modules to create those cross references and also to pull some definitions from other texts so that we can become very clear about what we're talking about. And it's also a good way of kind of, I think, supplementing our knowledge. So not everything is going to be easy. Not everything is going to be kind of heartfelt in a sense that no, we cover, we're going to cover quite a few technical points and I, I, t I intend to present some technical points like definitions of bodhicitta to speak a little bit of grounds and paths um, to what I thought of doing now was to look at the bodies of Buddha and to look at the differences between the bodies of Buddha. So there are going to be some technical details, but I think that it's good to work with those technical details because um, then, thank you very much, Tupten wrote, it's Kempo Kunpen, thank you, Tupten. So, um, so it's also a good opportunity to also become more informed. And particularly when you then go and receive teachings from great masters, like His Honest, the Dalai Lama and other things, suddenly you hear those stems that you came across in other texts and you can make better sense of them. So His Honest was in Australia quite a few years ago. I think that he taught this text maybe 10 years ago in Australia. I can't remember which year. He taught it, he taught it over three days. You know, it's quite funny to teach Shantideva's text over three days. So obviously it's, not, it's different to the teachings that we have here. When you, when you study with um, masters like His Honest, the Dalai Lama, what you get is transmissions. What you get is putting out essential points and creating imprints in your mind. But it's different to the teachings that we do here. You no, know, it's the different types of teaching. So it's honest, I remember, began with the wisdom chapter, which is like a big, oh my God. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? Now that wisdom chapter is so complicated and it supposes that you're well informed of the different schools of thought within Buddhist philosophy. It goes over debates across different schools of thought. And unless you have done a thorough study of tenets, you're not going to be able to understand much of it. So since this is the beginning of a new round of BSP, what we thought, well, the plan was to, is still, is still to go from chapter number one to chapter number eight to get a good introduction to the perfections in bodhicitta but we're not going to speak about wisdom a lot. I, su I suppose that Geshe will speak a bit of wisdom, but we're not going to cover the perfection of wisdom this year. Only once we're going to do tenets and also the study of some other topics, then we could go back to the wisdom chapter and cover it so that we'd be able to make sense of it. Otherwise, it's going to be a brain wreck. So what I thought of doing now is to look at 
um, the bodies of Buddha, right? So some technical details. And in order to do that, um, I'm going to first of all mentioned, mention the three bodies that Geshla spoke of today. So here it says, I pay homage to something with a Sugata's Dhammakaya. Let's put it again on the screen, sorry. Respectfully, I pay homage to the Sugatas who are endowed with the Dhammakaya. All right, so Buddha's body. To begin with, I think that the word body is confusing. This is the word that is used in Tibetan language. The word is ku, which is translated as body. Ku, in Tibetan it is ku. It is translated as body. But the definition of body in, in philosophical terms is a collection of its members or different parts. So we used to think of, uh, of this thing that we're kind of down pointing at here is this is a body. But in Buddhist philosophy, a body is just a collection of different parts. So for example, the mind is body. The mind, the mind is a type of body because the mind has different parts. But also, you no, know, this is my body, but there is also a person here, the person that is imputed independence upon this body. So this person is also a, collect, a collection of parts. Like for example, my parts are my body and mind. My parts are me of yesterday and the me of the day before. They're also parts of me. So as such, you know, this person that is here is also a body. This is in Buddhist terminology. So it's confusing, isn't it? Now we're used to thinking of body as this, but body can be different things. Now I'm beginning with this introduction because we're going to cover now the different bodies of Buddha. But keep in mind that when we speak about a body of Buddha, it doesn't mean that this is a physical body. Body can be different thing. It could be a mind of a Buddha here in this context. It could be a mind of a Buddha. It could be the emptiness of the mind of the Buddha. It could be also a person, a Buddha that is a person. And it could be other things. All right. Um, Chris, I will answer your question soon. So, um, but please, you know, please register with Kathy, um, Chris, so that you will get also um, everything on Dropbox. You know, you can just register. It's gonna, it's gonna make it easier. All right. So, I've prepared the following chart. I'm gonna share it with you guys. If I just find where it is, there it is. All right. Hmm. All right. So we have, first of all, when you look at Buddha's bodies, we have the first twofold division, Dhammakaya, which is Dhamma body, and then Rupakaya, which is the form body of Buddha. Right, that's first of all the, the twofold division of the two Buddha's bodies. So sometimes, by the way, we hear about two bodies of Buddha, sometimes three bodies of Buddha, sometimes four Buddhas of Buddha, sometimes the five bodies of Buddha. So the two bodies of Buddha are Rupakaya, form body, and Dhammakaya, Dhamma body. Now, for some reason in English, um, I think that maybe it was started by Jeffrey Hopkins, the, Dhamma body, the Dhammakaya was translated as the truth body. I don't know why the Dhammakaya was translated as the truth body because the word Dhammakaya is Dhamma body. How you, how you go from Dhamma to truth, I am not sure. I mean, I, I, can, I can make guesses, but Dhamma does not translate literally into truth, right? So you hear quite often in teachings or you, you find in, in English translation, um, you find the word truth body but keep in mind that this is the Dhammakaya. So that's the first two fold division. Let's look at, where is this? It's here. Let's look at the Dhammakaya. There are two types of Dhammakaya. There is the essence kaya and exalted knowledge Dhammakaya. So Dhammakaya in general refers to the omniscient mind of a Buddha. But the omniscient mind of the Buddha has also parts in it. There is the mind itself, but also the emptiness of the mind of the Buddha. So the emptiness of the mind of the Buddha is the essence kaya. All 
right? The emptiness of the mind of the Buddha is the essence kaya. And then we have the second type of dhammakaya, which is the exalted knowledge dhammakaya. This one. Sorry? Is the emptiness of the mind of Buddha. Which is a quality. Yeah, it is a quality of the mind of Buddha. It's and, a fish. And it is also referred to as a body too. Yeah, it is a body too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we have to be flexible in the way that we think of body. You know, body is not just a physical thing. Also, the emptiness of the mind of the Buddha is body. So the body is a collection of parts, right? So also emptiness has parts, therefore. So it's a bit technical, it's complicated. You're not going to be, you know, even if you don't understand everything precisely now, pigeon holly kind of make, you know, part of the process is getting used to new terms. You hear it once, you hear it twice, you hear it 10 times and bit by bit, things kind of, you know where to put them. So the essence sky is considered to be a body because it has two parts, natural purity and adventitious purity. It is also connected with Buddha nature. Um, I'm not going to speak about it now. It's a long explanation. It's complicated. So we will, we might go back to that later. You know, if people are really wanting explanation of what it is, then I can do it. But for the time being, let's suffice with essence ka being the emptiness of the mind of Buddha. Then we have the exalted knowledge Dhammakaya, which is a second type of Dhammakaya. Right, the exalted knowledge Dhammakaya. This is the omniscient mind of Buddha. So a Buddha has an omniscient consciousness. Um, a Buddha has an omniscient consciousness, which is, you could say, the method for benefiting other sentient beings. For those of you at home, we know it started raining now. You might be hearing also the rain through the audio system, but it makes it difficult, I think, for people here in this class to hear me. So I apologize for that. You can maybe come closer if you want. Um, yeah, we kind of we finish in five minutes. So um, anyway, so the main method for benefiting sentient beings is knowing their dispositions. You know, so Buddha has an omniscient mind that knows all phenomena. It knows all phenomena in their entirety. All phenomena exactly as they exist. But the main met method for benefiting sentient beings is through knowing their dispositions, their mentality, aspiration, habits, social background, and so forth. All of those features are included in the exalted knowledge Dhammakaya. And a Buddha's mind that, amongst other things, knows all of our dispositions. And therefore, a Buddha would know to give teachings that are specifically tailored to us, you know, targeting us, what teachings are going to be the right teachings for us. So that's the exalted knowledge Dhammakaya. Now, the second type of Buddha bodies are the Rupakaya, the form body. Now, we call it body, and Jampa suggested that why not call it dimension? I have to think about it, you know, to think of whether Ku can be translated as dim dimension. Um, I think about it, Jampa, but the confusing part about the form body of Buddha that many of them are actually persons. They're not body, they're persons. To begin with, we have the Sambhogakaya. It is the utility body or enjoyment body. This is how we call it in English, utility body or enjoyment body. Then we have another type of form body, another type of person, which is called Nimanakaya. This is an emanation body of Buddha. So, if you wonder what's the difference between enjoyment body, utility body, and emanation body of Buddha, a utility body of Buddha, enjoyment body, appears only to Arya Bodhisattvas. Only Arya Bodhisattvas can see it. It appears to them only in a particular realm. It, is, it appears in Akanishta. It teaches only the Mahayana Dharma. It is a particular form of Buddha that we cannot see. Now we, as ordinary sentient beings, I cannot see an enjoyment body. Only Arya Bodhisattvas can see it. Only Arya Bodhisattvas get, can get teachings from a Sambhogakaya. 
Sorry? Yeah. Then we have emanation body, so I'll just put it on the screen. Emanation body of Buddha, Nimanakaya, which has different types. You have Supreme Nimanakaya, Supreme Emanation body, Artisan Nimanakaya, Birth Nimanakaya, Various Nimanakaya. So we say that a Buddha can manifest in different ways for the sake of sentient beings, right? So you have, for example, the form of Buddha Shakyamuni, born to a mother, attain enlightenment in his life, displayed the 12 deeds of Buddha, including passing, passing away, turned the three wheels of Dhamma, right? This form is called Supreme Nimanakaya. So Supreme Nimanakaya is a Buddha that displays the 12 deeds of Buddha. It is a Buddha that turns the wheel of Dhamma. This is a Supreme Nimanakaya. We have artisan Nimanakaya, which appears to sentient beings as crafts, craftsperson, craftsmen, you know, teaching the arts, crafts, and so forth to benefit other sentient beings. We have various Nimanakayas, this type of Nimanakaya, which is, you now we sometimes say that a Buddha can manifest as a bridge, as a road, as, you know, as a vehicle, you know, to benefit sentient beings. So this type of manifestation as a bridge and so forth is included in the various Nimanakaya type. It is a manifestation of a Buddha, emanation of a Buddha that is a form body, a Nimanakaya body. So our time is up for today, it's running out. So, um, sorry? The birth one, I'm not sure, yeah, kind of, I, I left off the birth one and I was hoping that no one asked me because I was not, I was not totally sure where to fit it, but I'll find out, yeah. <laughs> now it is like now this question that you think that you know when I prepare the material at home I think that I'm not sure about this point I hope that no one asks me about it <laughs> so you know it's that uh, it's that point yeah so um we will continue to talk about it Jason has a question here is the subtle wind and mind of a Buddha an exalted an AKD um, exalted knowledge Dhammakaya um, I think that, well, I think that um, when you look at it from, a, from um, a tantric perspective, we speak about wind and mind in Tantra, particularly in high Yoga Tantra. So yes, the mind, the subtle mind of Buddha is an exalted knowledge Dhammakaya, and it comes together with wind, right? It is a wind that supports that. So... Um, yeah, I would say that both of them are, both of them are packaged, are found together in the Exalted Knowledge Dhammakaya. So, I've managed to kind of slot in a presentation of the five bodies of Buddha because of the first line in the first verse. We said that when, the, when a Buddha attains enlightenment, they attain those four bodies at the same time. Form bodies what is used to benefit others, which means that Sambhogakaya is used in order to benefit Arya Bodhisattvas, give teachings to Arya Bodhisattvas. Nimanakaya, emanation body, is used in order to give teachings to people like us, but also to teach us the crafts, the arts, languages, um, to act as bridges, roads, and so forth. This is for the benefit of others. For one's own benefit, we have the Dhammakaya, particularly um, going step by, by step, developing true paths, true cessations, eliminating the two obscurations, afflictive obscurations and then cog cognitive obscurations, you can say that it is done for our sake, not only for our sake, but mainly for one's own welfare, right? So Dhammakaya for one's own welfare, Nimana, um, Rupakaya, form body for the welfare of others. I will continue with that tomorrow because there are a couple of other things that are related to that. But since we, it's already four o'clock, then let's leave it here for now. There are a couple of other questions, that, general questions that um, I can see here in the chat. So maybe what we'll do now is we'll do the, the dedication prayers. After that, people are free to leave the session. And for those who still need some, um, to ask some general questions, Guru Puja, technical questions, we can do that after. Um, 
after we do the prayers. So I'll put it on the screen. Where is the prayers? Somewhere. There it is. No, it's not this. Sorry. Prayers, prayers, prayers. Praise be. Praise be. There it is. There it is not. Maybe I need to close this. Save. All right, there it is. All right. Chanchu semcho rimpo che ma che panan che yuchi che panyam pa me paya gone gondu pe wa sho. Let's write in English also just because we've covered that this session. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta, which has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen never diminish, but increase more and more. Thank you very much, people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katzen. Thank you.